Hey everybody, how's everybody doing today? Welcome to my Sunday live stream where we talk about photography and catch up as a community to see how everybody's doing. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, it's good to see everyone here uh, that has come in so far. And uh, <clears throat> as always, uh, the live streams are never planned or scripted and uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but, you know, a couple of things this week stuck out to me in the news uh, that that people have pointed out to me is, uh, and I haven't looked into this myself, but OM Systems is not planning on making a Pen F2, which uh, is not really a surprise. I've been saying this for a long time. I doubt they'll come out with another one. But given the demand for, or uh, you know, perceived demand for retro style cameras, it seems like uh, they're missing an opportunity here. And uh, I, you know, and this, this goes back to when they, when OM Systems bought, you know, the, the imaging division from Olympus, that, you know, they said the smaller, lighter company, they can be more nimble on their feet and adjust the market conditions more quickly. And I get it. You know that there's, I'm sure, some truth to that, but I'm not feeling that as, as the, you know, Olympus, OM Systems fanboy. <clears throat> um, I feel like they're running at the same pace or at a crippled pace compared to other manufacturers. And, and by crippled, I don't mean that <clears throat> anything's wrong with their products. Their products are fine, but... You know, they're working probably with fewer staff, smaller budgets, and they're doing as much as they can with what they have. And I think they're doing an exceptional job in that sense. Uh, but it's going to be hard for them to compete at the level of Sony, Canon, Nikon, for example. Uh, they just don't have the deep pockets that they do. And not that they need them quite as much, right? But at the same time, it does feel, it does feel like they're, they're picking and choosing which cameras they're going to develop, and they decided not to, to go with the Pen F2. And that's that's a real shame. I think if the market, I was hoping that the market is kind of stabilizing, or at least it appears that way for now, that um, they could explore, you know, other model or be a little bit more risk taking, right? Because there's there's a more stable market that they can do their projections and everything else. Cuz you know, they do have and I'm sure, you know, they have companies that they they outsource to for marketing data and research to help give them guidance to what they want to produce. And uh someone said don't make another pen F2, I guess. The audio is not good. Oh, sorry. That that should be better. I'm sorry. <clears throat> uh, I had the power source plugged into the mic, so it it adds a lot of static or weird sound. Hopefully, that's better. But yeah, I think I think that uh, this is this is unfortunate in that. You know, they, they cannot, or they're not willing to try a Pen F2 in the market. And I, I thought about this a lot since I heard this. And I'm trying to think, because obviously we have what? X100V, this most recent one, Nikon ZF. Uh, and and there was some rumor that Canon might come out with a retro camera, and Sony tries by adding a silver plate to their A7Cs, but those are not retro. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and when I look at the demand for used cameras, uh, it's insane the prices they're asking and getting for a lot of these used cameras that have uh, particularly fixed length uh fixed lenses onto them not necessarily fixed focal length but like you know a fixed zoom or a fixed prime on them 
like the LX100 version 2, version 1. These are old cameras. They should not be selling for what they were when they were brand new. Um, you know, I also looked at like the LX10. <clears throat> Panasonic's really the only other one that's come out with uh, fixed fixed length fixed fixed lens cameras recently. Uh, with like within the last five six years, right? Uh, because it's been probably closer to eight years since Olympus had one. It was the Stylus 1S, which is a fabulous camera. Um, but even then, they won like two, three hundred dollars for a Stylus 1S, and that's an eight-year-old camera. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, there is, of course, the TG5, 6, and 7. All of those are great cameras, but they're truly compact, weatherproof cameras. They are not... Uh, they're not a, a fixed length camera in the in the traditional sense of say like you know the LX100 or the LX10s, the RX7s. I'm um, not the RX7. That's a car. The RX100, Mark Seven, and and all generations before that. Uh, and I talked about this, I guess, a couple of weeks ago. You know, our fixed length cameras coming back. So I won't go too much into it again. But really, relatively speaking, I was thinking you could get an Olympus Pan F, you know, the old version, with a 17 1.7. Uh, and you have a package that's not too dissimilar than the X100 in terms of size and weight. I think it's about, with the lens, it's only about 100 grams more than an X100. Uh, which I think is a fair trade-off given the versatility that you would have with an interchangeable lens camera because you can grow into the system and it certainly has more features and all of that good stuff. And if you look at the used market for the Pen F, it's, you know, those cameras are still selling for what they were brand new, basically. If you can find one brand new mint in the box, it costs about the same as you would have paid if when it came out. So, you know, Inflation dollars aside, you know, dollar for dollar, they're about the same price. And then you can get one in very good condition for a little less. But it's it's insane. When you look at a camera like uh, a G, the G, uh, G100, I can find those for 300 bucks or less all day long with the lens for about 350, <laughs> you know. And that was an eight nine hundred dollar camera, and it's it's already half what it was when it came out. Uh, but <clears throat> it seems like there is a slight resurgence in pricing for the OMD cameras. They're not coming down; they've gone up slightly. EM one Mark three, EM one Mark two, OM EM tens, Mark one two, you know, Mark one two three four, EM fives, all of them. Well, not the EM5, actually. EM5 still continues to drop. EM5 Mark III and IV. EM5 Mark II is holding steady at about 400 bucks, uh, which is another amazing camera, EM5 Mark II. So that tells me that the market wants full metal body cameras. They want small cameras. Uh, with lots of capability and potentially weather sealing. That's it's never been on my radar weather sealing, but uh, that's all I hear over and over again. If only this had weather sealing, <laughs> you know. Like I said, I, I don't like to go out when it's cloudy, let alone if it's raining. It's it's not happening. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, weather sealing. So, you know, and everybody wants weather sealed F1.8 primes for whatever reason. I, you know, it's definitely, definitely not a deal breaker for me, but I understand for many it is uh, being able to take a camera out, you know, in the drizzle or light rain. Uh, I guess, is, you know, makes sense, right? The problem I have with fixed length cameras or fixed, fixed focal, fixed lens cameras. Uh, 
like the LX100, which I've been shopping like crazy for some reason. I, every time I get ready, I'm like, why? Why am I buying this? And I can't answer the question <laughs> other than gas. But, you know, once you get dust inside on the sensor, and it's going to happen, and, it, you know, like GR3 is known for that, LX100s are known for that, every camera, fixed fix focal, fixed fix lens camera has this problem. And sure, there are ways to clean them, different ways maybe, but it's always going to have dust. For many of us, it's just going to have dust for the life of the camera. And that always holds me back because I hate I hate dust on my camera in my images because I shoot at very uh, low apertures like f8, f11 all the time, and those dust spots show up vividly in the images uh, when I'm shooting like that. So I feel like there's 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 missed opportunity because I I just I don't know what why why ohm systems think that the pen f2 mark ii would not sell is it is it that they won't sell enough to get their money back because it costs too much to develop and retool all their factories and everything to make one or is it that even if they could be a little profitable in it it's not worth the effort just to make a little bit extra money i i don't I don't understand the logic here outside of somebody in marketing or some third party marketing firm that they hired told them the pen F will not sell. Don't make one. So uh, there it is. We're not going to have a pen F2. I, I hope that's not the case. I hope I hope they'll see some light for pen F2 and bring one to us. But. I've never, I've never held out hope for Pen F2, so that's why I bought two Pen Fs. <laughs> In case my first one ever dies, it hasn't. I have a backup that I can always go to, and hope. You know, I, I wanted to buy a third one, but prices just went crazy. I paid mine for brand new condition. I paid six hundred some dollars for my Pen F, mint, mint condition. It was a refurb from the Get Olympus website. And it had it only had a couple hundred counts on the shutter, so it's a brand new camera. Uh, you can't touch that price now. I could resell that thing for twelve hundred bucks right now because it's mint, you know. But I never will. It's a camera I'll never sell. Uh, and it's camera and and the Pen F in general is a camera I love taking out and shooting with. And this reminds me of uh, a video that. Uh, Why can't I, I, I'm sorry, my memory's not very good lately. But there was a video out recently by someone I've had on the channel a couple times, or once, I should say. And he put out a video the other day about the camera does matter, gear matters. But more from a emotional and ex user experience sense, right? If you don't enjoy the camera, you're not going to take it out as much and you're not going to shoot with it, right, ultimately. So, uh, and, and I've said this before as well, and I think many of us would agree that if we don't like the camera, <laughs> we're not going to use it, right? Uh, like, I have the Fujifilm X-H2 behind me. Lenses are fully flushed out for it. I bought everything I needed, right? 23, 33. 55 to 200, 56, et cetera. It's been sitting there right behind me. I, I take it out every now and then just to uh, do some comparisons between my Olympus OM system cameras for color because the colors are really weird on that Fuji. Uh, straight out of camera. You can apply a profile and it's perfectly fine. But that, my Sony A7R5, just sitting there. Every week you come to my live stream, you see them sitting there on the shelf. Where are my Olympus cameras? They're out, out here in my bag or in my tripod. They're the ones I take with me all the time. Because they're the ones I enjoy. They have the best user experience. 
Everything they do, they do well. They have never let me down. And it, it, uh, it's why I continue to support Olympus OM system cameras. Uh, Panasonic more recently, I've really been enjoying um, the Panasonic Leica 25. Uh, this Panasonic LX5. This I'm, I'll show you a couple more pictures that I didn't have last week that I got from this. It's just amazing. Uh, and I've been shopping for the 15 millimeter Leica, uh, you know, 1.7. And I'm debating between that or just using my 17 1.8, which I'm using right now for the stream on my EM10 Mark II. And I've been shopping EM10 Mark IIs because the current EM10 Mark II that I have that I'm using for live stream, the da battery door is broken, the mode dial is a little bit flaky, and the EVF to live view screen sensor is dead so the usability for that camera has gone way down for using it in the field but it's perfectly fine as a webcam right uh so I, i've been shopping those a little bit but those are going for like two three hundred dollars i think if i can get it closer to 200 than 300 i might get another one uh because again it's this is a fabulous camera the m10 mark ii I've looked at the Mark III and the Mark IV, but they just want too much money for those. You know, brand new, a Mark IV is about 700 with the lens. Maybe on sale a little less. That's the current sale price. They're giving a free lens with the M10 Mark IV for 700 uh, Great camera, and I would recommend it over just about anything else at that price point, even like the Canon R50, Canon R, uh, R100, certainly better than that. But it's a it's a very competitive market around six seven hundred dollars. But ultimately, the the Olympus systems have more features, and uh, like I said, do everything so well that I and and ultimately, it's going to be a smaller system than any of those other ones. If you want compact size and weight, EM10 Mark IV all day long. But anyway, uh, I just, I'm just really disappointed to hear, uh, and I think Vic had a comment, is that an official statement? It was something I re I've heard, but I did skim on Petapixels, or, my, or 43 Rumors website. Um, let me see if I can pull this up for you. This 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 article here, um, March twenty first, twenty twenty four, and it says here in a chat with the OM manager, they said the reason is that they think that would not it would not sell, and of course everyone disagrees, but. Uh, that's the only source I could find online at this point um, about that. And I, you know, like I said, I'm not surprised. It's a shame, but I'm not surprised. But if you look at that image, right? Let me, let me pull it up one more time. Um, this is the Pen F with the 17 millimeter F1.8. So it sticks out about one or two centimeters further than, say, the X100V. But overall, it's about the same package. It just has a little bit, it's a little bit deeper because of the lens. And like I said, I think it's a fair trade off for the versatility you get of an interchangeable lens system. <clears throat> but anyhow, uh, there's that. And if, if they're not going to make a Pen F2, if they do an OM5 Mark II, I'd really like to see them go back to a metal body if they can. 
I think this there there was a there was a race for who has the smallest lightest camera, and to make them lighter, you use plastic, right? And I've never had any issue with my EM5 Mark III, which is essentially the same body, right? Because I use a full bottom plate, but there's plenty of reports of that that tripod mount, you know, breaking, and. That's partially the fault of the user. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to knock the user off the hook for this. Sometimes it's not. I've I've heard I've heard stories, people I personally know, where that tripod is mount is broken for no reason. But <clears throat> that said, it's I think there's a lot of user problems because people are people are just putting too big of a lens and mounting things. You know, it's plastic. You have to take care, okay? Uh, that's why I put full metal plates on the bottom of all my metal of all my cameras, because I want to distribute that that force, the torques that goes that would be pressed onto that tripod mount across the bottom as much as I can. It's never a hundred percent. It's always going to be a little bit hot in the center because that's the only point of contact for the most part, or the strongest point of contact. But I I, I digress. Uh, I'd like to see a metal OM5 Mark II. We don't need to go super lightweight. I think I think that this this rush to go super lightweight and save every gram you can went too far. And we need to go back to making premium feeling cameras. Uh, and, and, and an all metal like the EM10 Mark II, all metal camera bodies. Look at the Nikon ZF, you know, solid, heavy. They didn't try to make it lightweight like the Nikon ZFC, right? That little APS-C version. If that thing was metal, I would have one right now. But it's, it is the lightest, cheapest, not cheap, I'm not going to say cheap, but it's certainly the lightest, uh, flimsy feeling plastic that you could possibly use, I think, on a camera. Whereas like the, the EM5 and the OM5, that plastic feels pretty durable. But in the end, it's still plastic. Because another issue that someone brought up was when they were mounting this on their tripod by the base, right? There's flex in it for their landscape photography. That's unacceptable for a lot of people, right? Having that little bit of flex, because it, like I said, it's just plastic. You can't, you just can't avoid it. And I would argue, you know, you should get a lens mount or a collar mount, or there's ways around it, right? That you can stabilize your camera. So you're not using the tripod mount to, on a tripod. You are using some other form of mounting, uh, L bracket, what have you. But ultimately, you know, there's there's a lot of, there's a lot of issues with using plastic that are uh, just make it feel less professional, whether it's in the look and feel or in actual use cases and durability, et cetera. So I hope that's the case. I mean, I don't know what they're going to do. They'll probably continue to make plastic because everybody's using plastics. Canon, you know, all of their all of their entry level like sub two thousand dollar cameras, as far as I know, are basically plastic. You know, R eight, R ten, R seven, all plastic bodies. Uh, they may have a more durable skeleton, but in the end, the the you know they're plastic. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the Nikon's, the what do you call it? I'm not familiar with their camera line, so I won't talk about Nikon, but I know some of their low-end entry-level cameras, Z50, I think, Z30. These are these are plastic. Uh, so everybody's doing it. But I think it was partially, maybe, you know, it does keep the cost down. But I, I, I feel like people would be willing to, because the only people really left in the camera market are enthusiasts right? And professionals, but we'll put that aside. We're talking about mostly enthusiasts, people that want to enjoy photography, enjoy the craft, enjoy the tactile uh, experience that you get with using a real camera. 
And that's all that's left, right? The, the casual travel everyday person, yeah, they're gonna use their cell phone. And that's fine. It's great for photography that more people are taking pictures than ever, you know, through cell phones. And some of that's gonna bleed off to people really wanting to go with a real camera. We haven't really seen that in the numbers as far as I can tell, other than it hasn't decimated the camera market other than the compact, you know, cameras like this. And this needs to make a comeback too, in my opinion. Uh, but not at the prices they're talking about. It's just crazy. I mean, what is the X100V is $1,600? I mean, come on. Uh, those should be like $800 cameras. Retail full price. They should not be $1,600. Ugh. Um, anyhow, those, those are my thoughts. Let me, uh, let me, let me catch up on the chat here with everyone. <laughs> See how everybody's doing. Um, wow, lots of people here. That's awesome. Jeff Painter, good to see you. Amir, good to see you. George, always good to see you. Bauman, good to see you again. And uh, Roberto, always good to see you. How do you like your uh, 20? I know you just got the 25 1.4. I watched your uh, video on that. Uh, but you didn't really talk about your images or how you feel because you just got it. So let me know what you think about that. I, I really love that lens. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, I mean, we're splitting hairs, but it's just a touch creamier, a touch more, um, uh, just, just a touch better in everything than the 25 from Olympus. Um, and then the audio, yeah, sorry about the audio and system mature. Good to see you. Oh, wow, you got back from a 10-day wildlife trip. That that must have been amazing. Uh, Marsha's here. Good to see you. Um, and let's see. John Follows, always good to see you. And it says here, if your tooling for Pen F is not available, OM will have to start from scratch. Very expensive proposition, which I don't think they can afford. Yeah, like in the manufacturing, right, where they have to... I mean, you think that robotics would sort of reduce that, that sort of, but I, I don't know anything about manufacturing, so I won't, I won't speculate. Um, <clears throat> Seraphim says, wish Olympus would decide to buy camera division back. The camera company is no longer exceptional in any way for the last two years. They have forced me to try the ZF to see if I like full frame. Yeah, there was, it's definitely a bumpy road, right? because we had towards the end of the olympus reign we had the uh, covid and that whole process of them selling everything so not many cameras came out and i'm sure there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm to, to design new cameras and things uh and then when om systems took over it took a lot of uh you know there's a lot of overhead there not financially necessarily there certainly was but a lot of overhead in terms of culture and and location and you know everything like that everything to do with going into a new company there's always that anxiety how is this going to work out even though it's not expressed publicly the individual people that work there you know they're going to have a certain amount of anxiety and um discomfort or uh <clears throat> time to uh transition not transition but adapt to the new company right so it's only been a couple of years maybe three now but it hasn't been very long right in terms of what companies company timelines and developing new products <clears throat> uh, what they are doing very well is marketing sports wildlife right uh landscape you know they have a lot of own system ambassadors doing an amazing job out there uh, and they do a lot of training, you know, Tech Tuesdays with David, it's awesome, and then the Coffee with the Claire's, and everyone else. You know, I don't watch a lot of the foreign language one, but they're, they're, they're in, you know, they're in all these different languages, and they're taking time to uh, educate people after the fact. 
And that, that support is amazing, right? I mean, how many other companies do you really see doing it to that level? I know Panasonic tries a little bit, uh, but they don't have quite, it's not quite as robust and diverse as OM systems in terms of aftermarket training and support online. Their support for repairs and things, I'm not talking about that, customer service type things. I'm sure that's fine. I haven't had to deal with it, but you know, you always hear mixed things about that, but I don't have any experience in that, but uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping in another two years or three years that we're going to see the kind of things that used to get us excited about Olympus, right? We're going to see some major innovation and uh, interesting, interesting cameras, not necessarily flagship cameras, but interesting cameras like another EM10 or Pen series, you know, the Pen EP7. You know, the one that's kind of like the Pen F without the viewfinder. Interesting camera, right? Not everybody's taste, right? Very interesting camera. One that I, I would consider getting uh, even today. But just price, I just I just don't understand. 500 bucks seems fair. That's about the going price. But it shouldn't be that much for something, you know, that old. But that just seems to be where everything is going price-wise. Um, I'm, I'm hoping in the next two to three years to see some ex exciting and or interesting cameras coming from OM systems. A lot of us that are more pragmatic, you know, we want to see new lenses, right? Weather sealed 1.8s and certain zoom ranges. Um, I get that. I, I, my, those kind of things are not on my radar because I already have all the lenses I want. I'm content without weather sealing. And the 300 F4 Prime, by far and away the best lens I think Olympus has ever made. Uh, <clears throat> even, I, I, I put it right up against their 150 to 400 with the, you know, the big white. I, you know, I haven't used that lens, but everyone that has that lens, not everyone, but the few that have had that lens, and communicated with me about the 300 F4, they found the 300 F4 to be just as sharp at the same focal length. Uh, you really only lose the ability to zoom, right, with the 300. Okay. Uh, Roger says, the reason I chose Olympus over the Fuji X-T line was the size, computation, and price. Yes. I mean, Fuji... Fuji has two major issues for me. The menu system is, <laughs> I know everyone complains about Olympus menu systems, but let me tell you, the Fuji menu system, that, that is something I get your, because there's so many options and they're scattered all over the place. Uh, I just haven't been able to adapt to what their logic is to putting things where they are in the menu. It just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, <clears throat> but that's, the, that's number one. Uh, and then, yeah, there's not really the, the auto focusing system. I'm sure it's, it, you know, it's works well enough, right? It's as, it's as good as anything I have now, including the Sony for the most part, but, uh, tweaking it, there's so many settings in it more than all than our OM one. The OM one has two settings like sensitivity and the other one, but you go into the pen F or the, uh, Fujifilm menu for autofocus, and there's so many settings. I don't know how anybody, like an average user, uh, would ever would ever figure that out. You have to really dial in and practice all the different settings to get it to work the way you want it to or expect it to. And I, I I'm not even willing to do that. You know, <laughs> I mean that's just way too much. I guess if I was a Fuji fanboy. I would take the time, like pal to tech is really good at that uh, with the Fuji stuff. You know, he's he's very enthusiastic and, and will do that for you, but not not me. I just, I've had this, this Fuji forever and it's like, you know, an X-T30 before that and some other ones before that. And uh, you've never seen me do a video on the menu systems or how to use a Fuji because it's just, 
I, maybe I could later, but right now it's just not happening. <laughs> but yeah, and the overall size of the system, the Fuji cameras are quite large. I was looking at an X-T3 yesterday because uh, they, they had one used, but it was mint condition for 900 bucks. And it included the, the a grip and batteries, charger, you know, it was mint, but also included a grip, which has some value. And the other thing was at my local camera store. So I give a couple extra, I'll give always give a few extra bucks to the local camera store. Then I would say I could get it online cheaper, right? But um, <clears throat> I looked at that and I was like, this camera is bigger than the EM5 Mark III or OM5. The lenses are certainly bigger and larger. And I'm not a big fan of the dials on top, you know, because it looks cool, but they're they're barely functional. What is it? Uh, ISO and uh, shutter speed <clears throat> on the top. You know, if you shoot an aperture priority, you're gonna put those two dials to A or auto and just use the aperture ring on the lens if it has one, most of them do. Uh, so it's a lot of wasted real estate. So it's it's one of those cameras that I feel like are like form over function. It's more about how the camera looks over function for me, right? A lot of people love to shoot manual, right? Or love to have direct control over the camera through a tactile means. And having the, the buttons on top labeled, etched in with the shutter speed and, and ISO, you know, some people love that, and that's great. Uh, it's just, it's just not for me. I'd like to be able to use use that real estate on top of the camera for other things. But anyway, um, good morning, Wayne. Good to see you. Thanks for dropping in. And I bought EPL eight for my sister. She never used it. The phone one in the end. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's a nice little camera, but yeah, to each their own. I mean, some people are just, like I said, some people are just going to use their phones, right? Um, they're just comfortable. I'm, I, I didn't grow up with phones. I'm not a big fan of using phones for anything, although I have to. It just, it kills me that I have to use a phone now. It's a necessity in life. But um, <clears throat> there, are, there are days where I leave my phone in my car because I forgot to, to, to bring it in. And I'll leave it in there for a couple of days. Battery will go dead because I have access, you know, via my tablets and things in the house. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I, phones, are just, ugh, phones are just a necessary evil for me. Uh, remember the Olympus XA, it had the sharpest 35 millimeter lens to the camera that Olympus ever made with a clip. Oh, I, rem I more than remembered, I have one. Um, let me find it. It was right here. I might've put it in my dry box. Oh, no, no, it is here, it is here. Uh, I put it in a protective case, <clears throat> you know, little uh, satchel. But yeah, this is the Olympus XA, right? Uh, sort of a range finder file camera. It's not really a range finder because it's uh, it has preset focus distances on it. But yeah, uh, I still got I still got about five shots left on this. I need to finish, and then I can develop the roll. This is a great little camera, so compact, right? Um, yeah, I need I need to finish the roll in this. But like, here's here's the Panasonic LX5. It's this is a tiny camera, and it's bigger than the X the XA, right? Just a little bit wider than the XA. See. Anyway, <clears throat> that's that's how small this is. Uh, here's my cell phone for comparison. All right, this is a regular S22. I, I forget which model this is. This is a regular Galaxy, a six-inch screen, not 
not the bigger the bigger ones like the ultras and the whatever they have <clears throat> it's a great great little camera um Yeah, so no pen app two. I don't know if that's their official statement, but uh, if you go to Forty Three Rumors website, they they have an article on it, and it may link to something more official or maybe an interview. I don't know exactly. <clears throat> and Sister Mature says my wife bought a pen app and used several years ago, and it was her favorite camera. Yeah, it is. It it's my favorite too. We have something in common. Uh, the Panasonic GM1 and GM5 did not sell well either when they came out, so Panasonic killed the line. Now they are cult cameras with used... I know. It's weird that when the cameras came out, you know, they didn't sell well, right? Like the Pen F didn't sell well enough. It sold, but not well enough. Uh... And the same must be true for the GM1 and GM5. And now, yeah, now they're kind of pricey. But I wonder how much of that is influenced by influence. I hate that word, influencers, like on YouTube and TikTok. Uh, those of us that talk about these cameras, because th this falls back in line with the uh, X100V. <clears throat> and I've seen this on a couple of different videos. I watch too many videos. <laughs> I should be making more videos rather than watching them. But anyway, um, you know, these cameras are, po you know, they, they suggested that these cameras are popular because they're just promoted so much by, by content creators on TikTok and YouTube. And people are buying them as a fashion statement or to be cool or hip or whatever, and not necessarily because they're into photography. And a lot of times, influencers, creators, they already have a major camera system. And, and, and this was also pointed out too, is we have, we have interchangeable lens cameras. So the X100 and cameras of its ilk would be like a second camera for us that we can go out and have a lot of fun with. So yeah, we're gonna have a lot of fun with second cameras because these other cameras like my om1 uh the only time i take it out for personal stuff is for birding because it has the bird detect but everything else street landscape whatever it's my pen f or one of my other cameras uh whenever i go out the om1 feels like a work camera to me it's very comfortable very easy to use you know, and if it were my only camera, I would have no complaints. Uh, but I have so many other cameras that I, I can go to that I feel like are more in line with uh, the kind of mood and feeling I'm in, the tactile feel. It's okay if a camera's a little bit awkward to operate. You know, that's part of its charm, right? Like, why did they put the dial here? Or, you know, why isn't this button over here? Why don't we, why do we have, you know, et cetera, right? Sometimes uh, the quirkiness of a camera gives us this charm. And that's why we love them. Uh, even though there, there's no pragmatic reason for them to be that way sometimes. But I, I you know, I, I wonder, and I've seen all these videos about GM5 and, and it drives me nuts when I see these videos about you know, this this camera shoots like film, or this camera is an alternative to the X100, or this camera is, you know, whatever. Um, you know, these are all clickbait ty kind of titles uh, that, you know, just, just are spreading this hype, right? <clears throat> um, and speaking of hype, Peter Forsgaard has <clears throat> a couple of videos on street photography, which are awesome. And they're not clickbaity. He has great information in those. And the, the images he shared are just amazing, right? 
he's he you know he i've always really liked his photography and when i've had him on as a guest or i've watched his uh reviews like when he does the uh monthly contest and he does live stream reviews of the photographs the kind of insight and comments that he makes about the photography of others and the, and the photography that he has of his own is uh shows that shows the experience that he has and i i really i really uh hope to be at that level someday to be able to to be able to look at photos and critique them or compliment them with the kind of uh legitimacy that he has right because i can look at a photo and i can like it but how legitimate or how how value is my opinion about someone's ph photography don't put a lot of weight in my opinion about anyone's photography even my own uh because you know when when you look at the kind of photography that other channels are doing like peter forsgaard you know in particular uh his photography really gels with me. I really like the work that he does. You know, Robin, if you want, Robin Wong has really great color photography, right? He likes punchy colors and street photography. Um, and uh, Maddie, Maddie's a little more pragmatic, right? Uh, he's, he's not always showing his best photos online. So I haven't seen too much of his work that where he really puts some effort into it. Uh, a lot of, a lot of, you know, maybe I need to watch more of his videos, but a lot of his videos are very pragmatic. He takes a picture of something to demonstrate something about the camera, and it's not so much about the photography itself. Although, you know, he gives tips and things. Certainly, his experience is is r right there with Peter, and I have a lot of respect for Maddie's work and the things that he does and his experience. Uh, so I don't want to take anything away from any of those guys. Those guys are all way, way better than I am. Um, and the angel says, I mean, I don't understand why the EP7 didn't make it out of the domestic market, but yes, due to gas and collectors, Pen F2 would sell better than the EP7. I think so. Yeah, I think so. And Anthony says, weather ceiling does make the camera more expensive, but it does give us photographers confidence that we could take our camera out with electronics inside. Well, sure, yeah. I, <clears throat> like I said, I get it. It's a very important property of a camera to have weather ceiling for many. It, it's not a deal breaker for me. If they came out with a Pen F2 and it wasn't weather sealed, I'd be okay with that. For some people, they would they would cry foul. You know, they would say that's a deal breaker. I'm not buying it because there's no weather. I get it. For me, it's just not a deal breaker. But I get it if it is, especially for you because you're in very cold weather and and harsh conditions a lot of the times because uh, you're way up north. And then Rob Trick just about to buy the Panasonic G9 Mark II as an upgrade to my G9. Nice. There's so many good deals right now. I saw there was a deal last month. You can get the G9 II with a $500 trade-in bonus or something. It came out to like $1,400 for a G9 Mark II. This month, they're giving like a 50 millimeter F1.8 lens free with the camera plus a $200 discount. So your effective price works back down to $1,400 for the camera body, about $400 for the lens, something like that. But it's still an amazing deal. It's so tempting. It's so tempting. But the G9 Mark II for me would be another work camera. It wouldn't be a camera that I would take out. And and my video requirements, if I had stronger video requirements, uh, I might consider it. But the OM1 meets my video requirements, which are very, very simple. Even in my paid work, uh, I don't need 422 10-bit, you know, ProRes internal, all that, whatever you know, those high-end specs for internal video. You know, 4K60 with the amazing image stabilization, even if I'm using a gimbal, uh, that combination has worked out really well for me. But yeah, definitely the G9 II, I think is every bit as good as the OM1 with the addition of more video features, right? Uh, so if I were buying today, if I didn't have the OM1, I would, 
I would I would have a tough time going with OM systems uh, given the G92's capabilities and price point. I mean, we're talking, uh, and we'll compare apples to apples, OM1 Mark One G92, you can still get the G92 for hundreds cheaper than the OM1 Mark One. Never mind the OM1 Mark II. Although I think the OM1 Mark II will be a better camera uh, aside from video for us photographers. But the OM1 Mark I and the G92, it's close enough where price is going to be more important. And ergonomics, right? I think, I think the ergonomics of the G92 don't fit my hands very well. But the OM1, awesome. The best handling camera I ever had is the EM1 Mark III. That was more comfortable than the OM1 because of the where your palm rests. It's a little more curved on the EM1 Mark III than it is on the OM1. But most of the time, my OM1 is on a tripod when I use it for work. And when I take it out in the field with the 300 F4, you know, I'm holding the camera by the lens and there's not much going on with my right hand other than pushing the shutter button anyway. So it's okay, the OM1, but the M, and another very comfortable camera is the Canon R8. That camera is extremely comfortable to hold. That almost made me switch how comfortable that camera is. And it's still on my radar. I, I need that camera to be well under $1,000 before I consider it. Because <clears throat> at 1000 to 1200 1300 whatever I can get it for today, it's not good enough, you know? Uh, it's just not. It's not a good enough camera to spend more than 1000 I'd rather have a Panasonic S1R. <laughs> I missed a great opportunity to get one at such a good deal a couple of weeks ago. I, I'm hoping that will come back. I'm hoping prices don't creep up on that camera. I hope they continue to just creep down and down <clears throat> so I can get a real bargain. But I need to be at about 1200 bucks on that camera. Right now it's around 14 to 15. At about 1200 bucks, I, I could do it. I could go back to the S1R. But anyway, do you think OM Systems is going to be here as a company in five years time or are they slowly shutting down the company to avoid panic in the industry? Uh, no, I don't think, I, I think they're gonna be here in five years. I don't, I don't see really any, any signs of them, you know, uh, what's the word you used here? I don't see any signs of them slowly shutting down, right? I mean, I get that they're they're every everything they're doing show tells me they're doing their very best, right, to to market and sell their cameras. We may not agree with their marketing strategy, but I think they're definitely putting a lot of effort uh, with with the release of the OM1 Mark II. I know it's 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 an iter you know a minor update to the OM1, which is why I'm not getting one. But still, a lot of work went into that camera to get it out to market. Uh, a lot of work went into the TG7. It's a very minor upgrade. I'm not getting it because I have a TG5, which does 90% or more of what the TG7 can do. <clears throat> working with Sigma to produce that 150 to 600 lens. Not a small feat. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, lot of behind the scenes things that go on to collaborate and develop a lens. You know, they didn't just call Sigma and say, make a lens for us and put our name on it. I mean, there, there had to be a lot of collaboration between the two companies. So they're putting a lot of work into Everything that they're doing, they're doing their very best, in my opinion. I think they're they're working hard to have this be a successful company, a profitable company, and a company that they can be proud of and we can be proud of owning and supporting. But make no mistake, it's not our obligation 
to support OM systems, right? I love them to death and their cameras, but it's their obligation to win us over, right? It's not, it's not on us. I can, I can talk about all the great features and I will, I will do it to the extent that I believe it, it's true, right? How compact they are, how they've never let me down, except I can go on and on about how I love OM systems. And, but the onus is on them to deliver for us to want to buy their cameras. So hopefully they will do that. Um, and they have for me at this point, but I'm one person. <laughs> I'm not the entire market, right? I'm, I'm slightly biased too, because I just, I just love, you know, I, I, I'm a little bit old school in that I think, uh, loyalty is part of what makes this world a better place. Um, it's not always about going for what is what is pragmatic, right? Going just the most pragmatic approach. Life would be just so boring if everybody was so, you know, pragmatic, right? And just did everything because this is the best or this is this works more efficiently. You know, we'd all, we'd all be driving, you know, or riding bicycles right now, whatever, or trains, you know, whatever is the most efficient. Everybody would be very pragmatic. Uh, I think that would be very boring. So I have a certain uh, flair or affinity for OM systems that is here, not here, right? Hence fanboy. <laughs> Long story, you know, the, the word for it is I'm a fanboy. Uh, but yeah, I. Like I said, the, the onus is on them to make us to want to buy their and want their cameras. And that's that's why I would love to see a Pen F2, because that would be, uh, that would just be sort of a gift for us loyal fans, and maybe not so much a marketing success, but it'd be such a great gift for OM Systems to give to their current fans. Uh, you know, cameras like the OM5, the OM1, TG7, these are cameras that try to get new market share, get new customers. These are not cameras that loyal fans are going to buy or appreciate, right, as much as a Pen F2. A Pen F2, like I didn't buy the OM5, right? Um, I'm a big fanboy, but uh, it didn't offer enough over my EM5. And TG6, TG7, you know, just didn't offer enough over my TG5. OM1 certainly offered a lot over the M1 Mark III for me. So that was a definite upgrade. But the OM1 Mark II, no, not enough. Not enough for now, right? Um, <clears throat> now I forgot what I was talking about. But yeah, the, the Pen F Mark II would be such a great gift. Uh, but they're just not in a position to do that, I guess, right? Because the market, even though I think the camera market has stabilized somewhat, we'll see. But right now it appears that way. They should be able to take some risk or do some additional things, expand their their camera line to include a camera like the Pen F. But I don't know. Anyway. I think they're going to be here in five years. I don't see any reason not to. Um, this question has come up a lot, Wayne, about it, tips for the Eclipse. People have been asking me. There was somebody that asked me, I think, on Instagram, and I, I can't find that message now. But I, if you did ask me something on Instagram about the Eclipse, I, I can't help you. I'm not shooting it. I don't know anything about it. Uh, so, yeah, I. it's just not something I'm going to shoot. So I don't... I haven't been looking into how to shoot it or what I would need to shoot it. I might, but I, you know, last minute, I'm always like fear of missing out. Well, maybe I should try, right? And then last minute, I'll order like a filter and, and give it a shot. But right now, I don't have any plans to shoot the Eclipse. Um,
That's an interesting point. Panasonic was stubborn about the phase detect, right? What what took them so long? I just don't understand. It, it seems like it would be an easy uh, an easy thing because it's not a new technology. It's been out forever. But they stuck to their DFD uh, up up to the very up to the wire, right? <clears throat> The M104 is actually lighter than the Pen F, also not as wide. Yes, it's a smaller camera, uh, the, the M10 Mark IV, and it's really nice. I mean, I think about getting it sometimes because it has the it's, the, it's the first Pen EM10 with the 20 megapixel sensor. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm like, 20 is not, not enough reason to get one because my Pen F is a 20. And my EM5 Mark II is such a good camera. I just, I just can't justify an EM10 Mark IV. I mean, I am pragmatic in some ways, but if they came out with a Pen F2, pragmatism goes out the window and I just get it because I think, assuming it's gonna be as beautiful or more beautiful than the original Pen F, uh, I would get it for no reason, no practical reason. If OM system actually brings some to you, cameras and lenses that they themselves have developed recently with big improvement would possibly give M43 users some confidence to buy more C and L. What is C and L? Oh, cameras and lenses. Uh, <clears throat> they're not going to do that. They, they, they are not heavy in the U.S. market. If I was in the U.K., I could probably get one. But here in the U.S., um, I don't get. You know, the U.S. doesn't get a lot of love from OM systems in general. Uh, if you look at 99% of the events and outings, they're all in other countries. The US, only recently have I seen, like with Emily Talpin and others, other ambassadors are putting together something up north. Uh, but I feel like that, that was probably, a lot of the effort was on their part, not so much OM Systems, and then OM Systems is supporting it now. But for the most part, I think they put that together. Uh, but anyway, um, oh, that reminds me, I'm going to be on Emily. I'm going to be a guest on Emily's uh, channel in a couple of weeks. I think April nineteenth. Anyway, if you go to her channel, you'll see. That I think she's already put up the live stream. Uh, so. Definitely, definitely check that out. I'll be, I'll be a guest for once, right? It's very rare that I'm actually a guest. <laughs> Nobody wants me. <laughs> I have to call them, right? People are like, don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> I think the Pen F was a relatively expensive camera. Yeah, I'm sure it was. I wouldn't doubt it. Um, MPB has a VF2 for 140. Wow, that's too much. Uh, I would pay the VF2, I would pay like a hundred. If it was a VF4, maybe closer to that price, but a VF2, that seems like a lot. Uh, yeah, I, I think it does. A heavier camera is always going to be a little more stable, right? I mean, not so heavy that you're shaking because it's so heavy, <laughs> but yeah, generally speaking, uh, heavier cameras. Assuming it's heavier because it has more metal uh, and more solid construction, it's going to be more stable in the hands. I mean, is it, there's a physics side to it too, right? Because there's going to be less motion up and down, left and right. The camera's going to have more downward pressure just because of, of its own weight, et cetera. I mean, we're talking minute differences, but... 
Anthony so I remember back in the film days, Olympus made the OM3 and discontinued, saying they will not make any more full manual cameras because of high demand. Yeah, I, that's before my time. People have offered to send me like an OM4T or just the OM4, maybe not necessarily. And I've always turned it down because there's so many electronics in it. Uh, it, it feels like it's just a little bit too old uh, for an electronic camera. Nothing's wrong with old electronic cameras, but I have an OM1, OM2, you know, the film versions, and those are good enough for me. And I have so many other film cameras. I just, I just don't need another film camera. Maybe a Leica, but not, not nothing else. Uh, God, my chat jumped again. I'm all the way back at the beginning. Um, and then sex says, I added metal grips to my ZFC, which actually needs, and now in the hand, massiveness is satisfactory. It is quite good camera. I think it's autofocus is better than the OM5. Yeah, I've seen I've seen a few people put grips on their ZFC, and I can see where that will give it some uh, robustness in terms of feel, and also, you know, in general, right? It's going to be more rugged. But I I just I can't get past my first impression of picking one up, uh, you know, because I I have. I've had Nikon SLRs, you know, film cameras in the past. I have some now, but they're plasticky. They're fine. I have like a, this is a really good camera. Um, <clears throat> this little N7.5, it's all plasticky. Um, But it's actually, uh-oh, I saw the screen freeze a little bit. But this is actually a really good little camera. So, and it's cheap, like $25 or something. It doesn't cost much at all. But if you're going to get a film camera from Nikon, this N7 V is excellent. It's really excellent. I think there's, oh, I got a roll. I got two of these. I have a roll and another one that I need to finish. <laughs> and that role is probably five or six years old now. I need to really either just develop what's left or finish it. So John says, on the positive side, I was out for three hours yesterday in heavy rain with OM5 using Pro Capture to get raindrop. Oh, interesting. Raindrop sequences falling off flows. I gave out wet and cold before. <laughs> I know, right? Wow, that's awesome. I know photography is so much fun. And this is this is who these cameras are for, is for people like you and I, right? That just enjoy photography and the things we can do with a real camera that we can't necessarily do with a cell phone. And if we could, we wouldn't enjoy it as much. I mean, the ergonomics on these things are uh, a pain. This, you know, and this this has pretty substantial cameras on it. Uh, a wide, a normal, a tele. And one of these has a 1 over 1.7 inch uh, sensor in it. You know, pretty decent size sensor for such a small camera or for a cell phone. But um, just I can't, I can't use it. Oh my God, my chat jumped all the way up again. Why does it keep doing that? It 
And John says, JRP bought Sony's laptop years ago, still going, but just does business in Japan. And me. I've seen a few of their Vio laptops. I have a Vio laptop before they got bought out by uh, JRP. Yeah, they're just a shell of what they used to be. I saw some of their laptops. They're just, yeah, they're, they're not very good. At least they weren't in the past. Uh, then Paul, Palumbo says, good morning. Are you taking tech questions today? I'm trying to combine interval time lapse with exposure bracketing. I have an EM. Oh, you cannot do that. You can't combine it, unfortunately. <clears throat> uh, I'm trying to think if there's a workaround. Um, your best bet, really, to try to do that would be uh, get an external intervalometer like the Pixel TW282. Uh, use an external intervalometer, you know, set up. I have a whole tutorial on using that particular intervalometer. Not specifically for this purpose, but you can extrapolate from that tutorial how to do it. But I would imagine you could set up the intervalometer, the external one, to continually take shots, but then have your camera in bracketing mode, right? So you put it in continuous shutter uh, with exposure bracketing. So one push of the shutter button will say, take three pictures. Say you got plus or minus three or plus or minus two. You, you have the shutter set up to take one picture and bracket three images with one shutter push. And then you have a delay of, say, one second between shots, depending on your shutter speed. If the three shots take more than one second, you're going to have to extend the interval of when the camera takes a picture. <clears throat> so that's how I would do it, is I would set up, use an external intervalometer, say I have a one or two second delay between each shutter push, Set up your camera in bracketing mode so that each shutter push fires all three shots or five shots, depending what you want to set up your bracketing for. And then um, uh, that should work, I think. Hopefully that makes sense. But I think that that would work. And Jeanette Newman, hello. Good job on self-portrait with the dog. She's per Oh, thank you. <laughs> that was a tough shot. I got to show you guys the... Uh, let me see if I can pull it up. I'm going to move this over here. Oh. It's not going to show well, but I'll show it anyway. Share screen. So I had to take like, so I set up the intervalometer, right? Starting here. I've deleted a lot of the images, but you can see. Um, she's just... She's just constantly moving. And it took a while before both of us were looking at the camera at the same time, right? Like here, my lips are just about to smile, then I smile, but she's not looking at the camera, right? So then she's like, just, now she's looking at the camera, but I'm not, I'm looking at her. <laughs> and now I'm looking at the camera, but she's not. So I had to just keep going and going. And it wasn't until almost the very end uh, that, um, let's see. Yeah, I think it was this one. It wasn't until almost the very end, because I only took a few more shots. Because after I, after I got that shot, I knew we were both looking. I was like, bingo. Finally, and then I stopped it shortly thereafter, just a couple of shots later. I took one more, and then I said, okay, that's it. So now I'm looking at the screen, and I'm like, okay, I got it. I was so happy right here. I said, I think I got it. <laughs> and then I, I ended the intervalometer session. But I sat there for a couple of minutes um, 
trying to get that that shot uh, with her. But that's that's you know that's how I did it because a lot of people ask me how did I get her to sit still for so long? She did not sit still. She was constantly moving, but it just took time after time, uh, shot after shot until I got that one perfect one. And then once I knew I got it, uh, you know, because at each time after I, well, not in this, not with the intervalometer, but, you know, I was able to tell right away. Maybe everyone wants to see the PENF reintroduce contact their OM system branch in their own country and ask OM system to please bring back the PENF. I, I don't know. It would, it would take millions of people to do that, right? I, I guarantee if there was a million people that signed it and sent a letter to them, uh, maybe, but I, I don't think there's going to be that many. Menu needs a search feature. Come on, camera guy, search feature. Wow. How would they implement that, though? How would you... How would you type in your search? I mean, it's a pain in the ass to type in your your uh, copyright info. Can you imagine having to type in a search all the time? I don't know how they would do it. I mean, you would need to have a keyboard with your camera. I think what you're showing actually was XA2 head zone focusing, focusing unlike the XA1, which you could actually control focusing manually. The more professional camera was the XA. I think you're right. I, I don't know the XA line that well, but there was one that was true rangefinder, I believe, like what you're talking about. Uh, and I have I have the XA. This is the XA2, definitely. But I don't remember the XA being that much different in size and stuff. I think they're all pretty similar in size, but... Feature-wise, yes, yeah, there were some significant differences or material differences between them. Yeah, that YouTuber guy called Snappiness said when he makes a video that eBay prices spike. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. That's why I haven't made any videos on a lot of the cameras I'm talking about or thinking about getting. I'll make it after I buy mine. <laughs> And then I'll have my affiliate links down so you can buy yours, but it'll probably be a higher price, right? <laughs> so that's how that works. Um, but, you know, after a while, people are going to catch on, right? They're going to be like, this guy is doing this just for himself, for his own benefit. It's not really helping anybody. Um, eventually, things people people will catch on and... Hopefully I try I don't do that, but Oof. uh Pete says, Hi Rob, just bought the OM5 last week to upgrade from my Pentax K7. Mirrorless is amazing and the OM5 is great. Thank you for all your Olympus tutorials. I'm trying to get my head around menus. Oh, you're welcome, Pete. I don't have the OM5, but the, the menu system is very, very similar to the EM5 Mark III and the EM1 Mark III. Right? So if you watch the EM1 Mark III videos. That should get you about 90% there. <laughs> but I don't think, and, and then also, you know, David, Tech Tuesdays with David, I think they have some live streams talking about the OM5 where he goes into the menu. It's certainly, there's certainly some resources, not a lot, unfortunately. Uh, I don't have the OM5. I don't have my M1 Mark III anymore because I sold it to get the OM1. But, uh, yeah, there's unfortunately not a lot of resources anymore. <clears throat> I guess I'm the only one uh, that deep dives in the menus. You know, I know Robin and Peter and uh, have some legacy videos on older cameras, but I don't think they have any really deep dive. I think Peter might have an OM5 best settings video, but it, they're the same on the M1 Mark III, so whichever one works. Uh, Every minute of every day, 500 hours of content is uploaded to YouTube. Yeah, that's a lot. About, 
maybe five minutes of all of that is any good, right? And Sinner says, I have a strange problem with one of my own one cameras. When shooting burst shots in quick succession, the camera starts buzzing in an area, but oh, I haven't had that happen to mine. That's weird. I've never heard that ever. I'll listen for it next time I'm out, though. Might be in, might be a few days before I get out again, but uh, I don't think I've ever heard that. The XA was a rangefinder camera. I'm pretty certain the camera show there is an XA too. Yeah, yep, you're right. You're right. Mine, mine is mine is a fixed focus, or or what, I forget what they call that exactly. But you dial in the focus, preset focus points, right? Infinity, close up, and uh, normal. The the rangefinder style, yeah, probably had a slider or something, you know, so that you can get the crosshair, not the crosshairs, but the uh, probably had a viewfinder. It would have to have a viewfinder too, right? This doesn't have a this does have a viewfinder. But there'd have to be some, you know, parallax type thing in the viewfinder as well. <laughs> Whose puppy did OM system kick this week? I think the, the Pen F2 people. And cameras and cell phones take excellent photographs, but too frequently you get text. Phone calls, alerts, interfering with the picture. Yeah, I know. Phones phones are multi-purpose devices, so that's the other thing. You're going to get interrupted sometimes, if not a lot. I got the GM Mark II deal at B&H. 500 off plus 300 trading credit, total 800. Yeah, that's the deal. That's the deal. That is a, that's a killer deal, right? Because it's a $500 trade at B&H. I was I was so tempted. I was like, wow, four but then I was thinking 1400 bucks, I could get an S1R. I know it's not not as good as the G92. Uh but it's a very different, you know, it's a very different camera. So that's that's why I held off. But I was very tempted myself. So I'll be using the G9 Mark II mainly for video. High spec with 120 FPS and 4K can attach an external SSD. Yeah, see, I forgot all about that. 120, 4K, SSD, that's amazing. Amazing what you can do video-wise. You know, you have to rig everything out so it all comes together, but yeah, it's not even an option on the OM-1, right? <laughs> Don't be a fair weather photographer. I know, I'm a wuss. Oh, I'm sponsors Petapixel Podcast. Okay. Yeah, I've seen that. Okay, John, we'll see you later. You left like half an hour ago, but thanks thanks for coming in. Hopefully you're back. If you're watching this again, I hope hello again. <laughs> uh, you mentioned work with a 300 millimeter. What kind of work is that? Spo oh, no, no, not work. Uh, I work... I, I may have misspoke if I said that. I do use the OM-1 for work, right? Mostly. That is not... I don't really have joy for that camera. There's no no love there uh, from the heart. It's more of a pragmatic type. You know, I love this camera, but it's more pragmatic reasons for work. The 300 millimeter is purely for pleasure, right? Birding. I don't use that for work at all. I think there's a lot of us that invest a lot of money in lenses and accessory made by Olympus and OM system that do not want to see our hardware money go to waste. We're not fanboy. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of us out there, professionals or serious enthusiasts, right, that want to have that long-term relationship with the camera company for servicing reasons, upgrades, right, uh, customer service. <clears throat> You know, there's there's a lot of things that there's, you know, from a from a user standpoint, sometimes there's very little difference between a professional user and a serious enthusiast. They both have the same demands of a camera company, which would be, of course, you know, customer service and support, 
uh, upgrades and improvements to the current system, filling in those gaps where things are, you know, whatever. Uh, so from that that standpoint, I understand. It's not the position I'm in, right? I, I'm, I'm more of in the position, you know, if they don't make it, it's okay. There's a lot of other cameras I can use, <laughs> buy and enjoy. Uh, but for a lot of people, that's not the case. They, they're they heavily invested in the system and they, they need it to last five, 10 years, right? Whatever that might be. They need it to last for multiple two of reasons. Whereas it's okay for me. If they go out of business tomorrow, <laughs> I'll just buy another camera. You know, it's no big deal. Uh, even though I'm heavily invested into it and all of that, and I do use it professionally, I'm okay, right? But for a lot of people, that is that is not that is not the case. That is not why they bought into the system. It's you know they, and it's not what they expect long term, right? I get that. Oh, hey, Eric, good to see you here. <laughs> and, and thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. Um, Eric, Eric's, Eric sent me some a few bucks the other day. I really appreciate that, as, as many of you have. It, it does help me out a lot. Um, I've been seeing the M1 X go for 700. Yeah, me too, right? And I've been considering that or getting the M1 used at 1500. A little nervous about spending that much. Okay, if you're in the United States, I think I saw an OM1 for 1200 bucks uh, over at Fred Miranda. Check it out before it's gone. I was tempted to get a second one. I think I saw it there this morning. But anyway, let's say you're gonna pay 1500. It's worth it. Don't get the M1X. The OM1 is so much better for birding and wildlife, if that's what you're gonna use it for so much better. If you're gonna use it for like event photography, where you're gonna be focusing on people's faces and eyes, EM1X is better, especially because the grip is built in. You can do a lot of portrait uh, shoots as well. And if I did more event portrait type photography, I would definitely get a grip for my OM1. Um, but if you're in a position of getting the EM1X or the OM1, the autofocusing system for sports action wildlife is so much better on the OM1. It's worth every penny. The M1X, on the other hand, if you're not worried about sports action wildlife, but you're doing people shots, um, I think the M1X is a better choice uh, for doing portraits and people type shots because the built in grip, the autofocus, I think is just as good as the OM-1 when it comes to eye detect. And uh, if you ask Robin Wong, he thinks the older EM-1, EM-1 Mark III, EM-1 Mark II autofocusing system is better in low light. Um, I haven't experienced the problems he has, but if you ask him, he's gonna tell you EM-1X is gonna be better for low light, low contrast situations. Um, And Anthony said the only advantage of the OM3, OM4 is they had 2% spot meter. OM14 OM corrected the battery leakage problem that was on earlier models. I have the OM2S, which has the spot meter in it. Uh, I don't really use it, but it does have it. It's one of the reasons I got it originally. That was one of my cameras that I had in college, actually, is the OM2S. And Adam Farr says, do I need DxO Photolab and their denoising program, or is there actually included in Photolab? Okay, you have to get Photolab Elite. If you get regular Photolab, it's not included. If you get Photolab Elite, that has the denoising Deep Prime XD. Now, Pure Raw 4 just came out. It has a new denoising program, Deep Prime XD 2. That is a little better than the regular Prime XD. And it at first it looks like it's a lot better. I was playing with it uh, yesterday or this morning, 
is yesterday. It had to be yesterday because I didn't do nothing this morning. Uh, <clears throat> I was able to tweak the Prime XD that comes with Photolab 7 Elite uh, to get very, very close to what the new D Prime XD can do. So that said, if you're currently using a photo editor other than Photolab, I would stick with that and get the Pure Raw 4. If, if you want to get out of whatever photo editing software you use, Photolab 7 with D Prime XD Elite version is the way to go. And you can tweak it so it's very, very close to what the new Prime Pure Raw 4 does, at least my initial test that I did yesterday. But I was still wasn't able to get as good a result with the regular D Prime XD versus the XD version 2. Uh, so they definitely did some improvements. Now, that said, D Prime XD 2 is not going to be put into Photolab 7, at least not in the near term. My guess is it's going to come out with Photolab 8, which is usually around Black Friday, right? That time frame, it seems like every year around October, November, they come out with a new version of Photolab. So if you can wait until then, that's the time to get DxO products is right around Black Friday. Uh, if you cannot wait, then you're fine with DxO Photolab 7 with D Prime XD. Don't worry about the minor improvement that you get with D Prime XD 2 that's in Pure Raw 4. It's a little better. It's a little better. And it's only really noticeable in extremely high ISO. And for those of you that are curious, you have Photolab 7 D Prime XD now, like I do. Then <clears throat> The, 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 what I found was that I have to reduce the, there's, there's a slider under the advanced section for D Prime XD. Reduce that down to minus 20, right? If you reduce that down, the force detail slider, reduce that down to minus 20. That, that seems to give uh, similar results to D Prime XD 2. Not as good. But similar enough, because the problem the problem with XD, the D Prime XD versus the D Prime XD two is D Prime XD tries to pull out too much detail, and when it does that, it starts looking at the noise in the photo and thinking that there's detail there when there's not. It's just noise. So you start to get some weird artifacts and smudginess in D Prime XD that you don't get in D Prime XD2. D Prime XD2, the background, the smooth areas, the very smooth areas where there's no details, it does not mistake the noise for detail. It definitely smooths out things where they need to be smooth. Whereas D Prime XD, I noticed that it tries to pull in detail where there's no detail because it gets these false positives, I guess, from the noise in the image. So dialing back the force details on D Prime XD will get you probably 90% of D Prime XD2. Where I did notice D Prime XD2, and this is where it's better, no matter what I did with D Prime XD, D Prime XD2 is uh, when there's very, very subtle differences in tones, right? Like let's say this is 18% gray and this is 20% gray it can see the difference between these two tones. Regular D Prime XD, it cannot see the difference between these two tones, so you're going to get one tone. So that's where I see the difference. <clears throat> I'm going to have to do some more analysis. This was just me playing with it yesterday. But yeah, that's a long answer to your question there, Adam, but short answer is, Photolab 7 Elite includes D Prime XD. Get that. If you want to, if you already use a photo editor that you like and you want the better noise performance, albeit it's very subtle, you can get Pure Raw 4 with the XD2.
Okay, good night, Pete. Um, good morning. Let's see. And Ravi says, in view of OM system releasing the lens 150 to 600 lens bird photography, and do not mind the extra weight, it will be nice if they can introduce a 302.8 at an affordable price. Wow. Yeah, that would be something, right? The original four-thirds system, I believe, has a 302.8. I wouldn't adapt it to use for birds and flight stuff because I think the autofocus would be a little rough, but um, hi Rob, love the chat on everything Pen F. It's my only camera. I bought the 17, 25, 45, 75, 1.8, and the Pro 2.8 zooms, the 7 and 14, 12 to 40, and 41, 50. Great. Yeah. Wow, you've really flushed out your lens system. Um what you need to get is the 12 millimeter F2 or even better, 12 millimeter F1.4 from Panasonic Leica. Then you're done. <laughs> um, because of past practice of JFP with other companies, it does not give Olympus OM system users any confidence in the future. Unfortunately, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, I hope you're wrong too. Um, <clears throat> but it's hard to base what JFP does with other companies with OM systems because they're very different companies. Like, you know, Sony Vio, those are laptops, not cameras. There's certainly some similarities or verticals that are similar because they're both technical products, right? Consumer electronics products, but it's a very different customer. <laughs> People looking for laptops are usually not looking for cameras. Um, so the direction they go with other companies may not be indicative of what they do because remember, uh, o Olympus still owns a percentage of OM, syst of OM systems. So they have a vested financial interest in their success as well. But I, like I said in the beginning of the stream, I'm a little disappointed with the pace that they're going at to introduce new products and new features, right? I appreciate the OM1 Mark II and everything it has. And I think if I didn't have the OM1 Mark I and I was buying today, I would get the OM1 Mark II, no question. Uh, but you know, the today's market, you know, they're a smaller, more efficient company. They should they should be working faster. Uh, but I, you know, if if they have a they have a finite number of resources, both in in people power, brain power, and financially, right? It's a finite number of resources there. And I think they're doing the very best they can with each one. Um, but we'll see. Always amazed at the quality you get with the 14 to 40. I owe a lot of that to, <clears throat> number one, it's always, it's good lighting, right? Uh, lighting makes the biggest difference in perceived image quality. But number two is because I use DxO Photo Lab. That, that photo editor gives me the most amazing results from the most mediocre lenses. Not that the 14 to 42 is mediocre, but it takes it takes even like these these very old digital cameras and makes them perform. I'm gonna sh I gotta show you an image from this camera that I took and processed with DxO. It's just amazing. Um, but I attribute a lot of that to DxO. So let me share a screen. So this is my browser. <clears throat> so yeah, like this, this is the shot I took with the kit lens, right? And this is downsized to 25. Oh, it's not downsized, it's actually upsized slightly. But yeah, this is the kit lens. I mean, it's, it's shocking how much detail is here. 
You know, not not that you want to see all the pores of my skin. So we'll look at Ellie. Um, you can you can see detail in the iris of her eyes, even right. Uh, fourteen to forty-two kid lens, and you can see the the uh, reflection of the two uh, LED light panels. I need to do a review on those. But yeah, um, shocking. And then the LX2, let me go up. I was, oh wait. I did a lot of practicing this week. This is the Panasonic LX2. Or LX5, I'm sorry, this this LX5 camera. 10 megapixel, 10 megapixels, right? Fixed lens. And this is the detail I'm getting with because I processed this in DXO. So I sharpened it a little bit. But you know, this this DXO is able to extract detail and polish the images to a point that, you know, I, I'm just, I'm just floored by how much detail I can extract out of a camera, regardless of its age and lens system. So I just, I just wanted to share that with you, just, just to give you some perspective on, I give a lot of credit to you know, good lighting, because that owl was good lighting, right? But also to uh, the software DxO optic, optical module, being able to extract that detail, sharpen the image without over sharpening and creating artifacts, and then reducing noise. It does so much, in, and it does it so well. Because when I compare that to the straight out of camera JPEGs, it's not even close. <laughs> The straight out of camera, I don't think I have it anymore, but the straight out of camera JPEGs for that owl, yeah, they were they were not that great relative to the image that I was able to process using the raw image out of that that software. And Rob, if you were OM systems, where would you add in the lineup a new camera model with the Pen F out of the picture? <clears throat> That's a tough call. Uh, I would add something along the EM10 range, right? Um, something that could compete with, say, the Canon R50. So fully articulating screen, phase detect, animal detect, all the subject detect, right? Because it's the R50 has that, the Canon R50. It needs to be able to compete with the Canon R50 on a technical level. I think noise performance and everything else is pretty on par with APS-C. Micro Four Thirds APS-C, there's not that much difference. Uh, you know, if you pixel peep the hell out of an ISO 12,000 image, yeah, you're gonna see a little difference. Um, but for the most part, we need to be able to compete on a technical level with say the Canon R50. But then at the same time, on an aesthetics level, it needs to compete with something like the Nikon ZFC, right? Uh, or ZF, something that keep its retro look. And to do that, uh, unlike the ZFC and the Canon R50, if you made an all metal body, right? Or at least have some metal on the exterior, you can have the grip and everything else plastic, but the top and the bottom plates of a camera you got to make that some kind of premium metal. Then I think you can charge more than a Canon R50, which is around seven, eight hundred bucks, but maybe less than a Canon ZFC, right? So it's going to step on the feet of the OM5. But then if you step the OM5 up to metal, right? I'm just just spitballing here, but. That's what I would like to see is a beautiful entry level camera sub $1000 you know maybe 899 but all metal not all metal but top and bottom metal plates uh with a more retro feel and design to it 
um, even more than the current EM10s. Although I think the current EM10s look very retro uh, to most people. I'm kind of used to seeing EM10s as they are. So they don't look retro to me anymore. They look like regular cameras. But if you could do something more retro, uh, that that's that's where I would go if I were OM Systems. Um, I I don't know if that would be a success or not. But it seems to me if they can they can match the technical level of the Canon R50 and match the retro aesthetic feel of the Canon ZFC or ZF. They'd have a winner, uh, and it has to be sub one thousand. Because if they came out with a Pen F two, they're not going to be able to do that sub one thousand, right? That's going to be fifteen. That's going to be like a Canon, you know, the Fuji X one hundred V price, fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars. But I think they could do it with a Pen F. Oh, I'm sorry, an EM ten Mark IV, five. OM. Let's call it the OM ten. <clears throat> wow, you never had a 14 to 42. It's a great, I love that lens for street photography because you can open it up to 14. So you get a 28 millimeter field of view, which I'm really enjoying now, not just for street, but even for portraits and, and just about everything. I love 28 millimeters for some reason. I don't know why I never fell in love with 28 millimeters before, but I just love it now. No keypad, just have your phone pad. Oh. That's true. You mean phone pair with the app. That's a great idea. You're referring back to when we were talking about a search feature for things, right? Um, they'd have to go a little further, right? They'd have to be able to make the app open the menu up in the camera to what you were searching for, right? Because if you're just going to search for something, you might as well just use the PDF manual because you can search that. But if the app could pair with the camera, you search for a feature, and then it opens the menu on the camera to that specific page that you need, right? So we're talking about not using the live view feature of the app where you can remotely control the camera or see what, because that, that would be hard to do to have both. But they could certainly have the app pair up with the camera and use a search feature on your phone to find a particular setting, then open up the camera to that menu page. That would be cool, right? So OM Systems, if you do that, I want credit for that and royalties for that idea. <laughs> or me and Wayne. Me and Wayne need to get credit and royalties for that. Uh, so Wayne gets it for the initial idea. I get it for the fine tuning of making it open up that page. Yeah, I'm waiting too. I would like to see what they do. I mean, OM5 tempts me all the time. You know, because the face detect on the EM5 Mark III is not great. I mean, I'm sorry, the face detect is fine. It's the eye detect. The eye detect on the EM5 Mark III is not great. It always gets my face in focus, but it's usually my nose or my forehead, but my eye, very rare. Uh, Whereas the M1 Mark III, the OM1, eye focus was really good, but not, not the M5. So I was thinking the OM5, being that it has uh, mostly EM1 Mark III qualities, and I think the AF is even better on the OM5 than it is on the M1 Mark III. So I've heard, you know. Uh, that's the only reason I'm slightly tempted is. I don't always want to take out the OM1, right? I rarely like to take that out unless I'm doing birding. I'd like to be able to take out like an OM5, something smaller with the 12 to 45 F4 or 14 to 42 kit lens, doesn't matter, and have reliable eye autofocus. Um, so that's that would be nice, but the fact that it doesn't have USB-C, and I know this is this should not be a deal breaker, but that's the additional problem I have. Uh, well, that well, that's not the additional. That is the problem I have. Is 
I have to use a dummy battery, and I have a dummy battery. But I'm I'm really starting to enjoy the convenience of having that USB-C port in my other cameras, and just plugging the camera in and having it charge relatively fast or power off the USB-C bank. I'm starting to I'm starting to enjoy that more. Again, it should not be a deal breaker, but if the OM5 had a USB-C port right now, I would probably get one because of that and the better eye detect autofocus. But I can wait. I can just use my OM1 if I need reliable eye detect or my Fuji or my Sony if I need it. I mostly use my OM1. That's why these are on the shelf. I'm using the OM1 right now for some self-portraits, so I got good reliable eye detect. I could not use my EM5 Mark III. It kept missing. It kept missing the eye. Um, yeah, David, we got to go out. I think tonight we're going to the moonrise. I haven't decided if I'm going to go to that yet. Uh, I might bring my Fuji if I go. Because last year we went, I took my OM systems camera. This year I think I might take, take because I never take the Fuji out for anything. And I have the lenses for it. <laughs> I just need an excuse to take it out for something. But you're going to have to let me borrow your 150 to 600 this week. When you're, when you're working, uh, maybe I can borrow it one day. I'll, I'll ask you later. Um, Hi, Dale. How are you? Thanks for coming in today. Good to see you. And Jack says, just started using the Pentax M50 on the M5. Oh, the, the lens. The Pentax M50 lens on the M5 and EPL7. The vintage lens is amazing on the cameras. Yeah, it's awesome. I like using the OM System 50mm 1.8. Uh, I like it because the lens is very, very compact. The OM system lenses, like for the original OM1, OM2, OM4 uh, film cameras, those lenses are very, very compact uh, and yet give amazing performance. That 50 millimeter, like you stop at the f2.8, it's really sharp. But anyway, uh, I, I have I have heard the Pentax 50, the M. There's one of them that's supposedly really amazing, and that I am curious about that lens myself. The problem I have is. I probably adapt it to like my Sony or Fuji because a hundred millimeter focal length is that's that's a little hard to work with for the kind of things I would use it for. Uh, I guess it would work for portraits, but I don't do a lot of portraits, and I would I would need. But anyway, yeah, I I'm sure that's that is a great great lens. It's just I I shot with the fifty millimeter on my Micro Four Thirds. And I got great pictures out of it. Man, it was hard to work with. Uh, and I'm just not used to working that long. I, I like wide lenses. <laughs> now, sorry, the fair weather photographer was for the people who keep jumping brand. Oh, okay, sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you meant with the, the actual weather. <laughs> yeah, people do jump brands a lot. And that's okay. I mean, you know, whatever whatever makes you happy. Because I get it. You know, it's like, I think for some people, switching brands is just an excuse for their own bad photography. And I'm not saying that about anyone here, but I'm just saying there's some people that think that the camera's holding them back or, or messing, and not they're not getting doing good photography because of their camera, so they switch brands. Or... They're more into the gear and the technical qualities of the gear. You know, like this this camera is just 5% better at autofocus. <laughs> I got to switch brands, man. I don't know how I lived with this terrible autofocus on this. It's okay. I mean, I, I get it. You know, I was like that when I was younger. I mean, I was in the computers and things, and I was like, man, this, this computer is 10% faster. I got to get it, you know? I need this is back when computer upgrades were like every every year, two years, man, you had to get a new computer because it was so much faster. 
<clears throat> but ultimately, I think I, I hope that most of us here are really trying to improve our photography. And that's why most of my videos about the cameras, they're not necessarily reviews, but they're more about how to use the camera or answering questions about certain features. You really don't see too many camera. I don't, I might have, I can't remember. I might have some camera reviews. I don't know. But I do mostly tutorials on my channel. Not so much this year. This year I've been just flooded with product reviews, which are great products, you know, like anytime this, this is, anytime I get a review for a lighting product, I take it because lighting is one of the best ways to improve your photography. And that's why I review the lighting products. Um, so I, you know, they don't get a lot of views and, and generally speaking, a lot of photography channels that talk about photography or when they do talk about photography, the views go down. You ask Robin and Jimmy. Of course, uh, Peter's having some really good luck with his street photo videos, and deservedly so. They're awesome videos. His street photography videos he's done, he's getting a ton of views, which is awesome. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, if you do a, uh, like I've done a few videos about how I got certain shots, not very, not not a ton of views. Whereas if I do a lens review or or uh, gear review, they get a lot more views. But I'm I'm not really a gear review, like camera gear review kind of guy. If I get a lens every now and then, I don't get too many lens officers. But every now and then I'll get a lens to review. But I've been focusing on lighting products because honestly, that's the best way to improve your photography is is good lighting. And I get it. It's limited to use mostly indoors studio situations. Uh, but I, I'm going to do some flash photography reviews next week or the week after. Uh, I have this LED panel review I need to do. Uh, that's how I took these shots with Ellie, is I used the LED panels. So, um, yeah, lighting lighting is really important. So... I'm going to try and do more videos about lighting, not just the gear review stuff, because those, those are kind of obligatory. They send me the lights and I have to review them. But I, I try to pick lights that have a purpose. Every light has a purpose or function. You know, panel lights are different than spotlights and LED lights and LED lights are different than flashes, but they all have a purpose, right? Very specific purpose and very specific way they light particular subjects and different use cases, right? Flash mostly outdoors. I don't use flash indoors too much anymore. I used to all the time. And I still do when I need a lot of power, like in my, my professional work. But generally speaking, for portraits, you can get away with LED lighting. Panel lighting, spot lighting, you know, cob lighting, <clears throat> using different modifiers. What you see is what you get. All the benefits of LED lighting uh, because you don't have to deal with the sun, right? Outdoors, very bright light. So LED lighting is indoor, ideal indoors. Uh, Robin, good to see you. Better late than never, but I am, I am almost done, right? I try to keep things down around a couple hours. Well, I knew good deals on the G9 II in Europe. <clears throat> oh, really? I'm sure it'll come around. They're probably testing the market here because Panasonic does have a good presence here in the U.S. Um, well, let me rephrase that. They're not doing any less in the U.S. than they are anywhere else. They're doing about equal, right? But they may be testing the waters here, what deals generated the most sales or incitement. <clears throat> Usually the deals I see in Europe are get a free lens with your camera. They they don't do that too often here, although they are doing it now. But they don't normally do that. Normally in the U.S. you see rebates and trade-in, right? Trade in your camera, get an extra 500 bucks. That's very common. <clears throat> That's how I got my Sony. I got 500 bucks plus $400 off the retail price plus the trade-in values. I paid well under three grand for my A7R5. But 
in Europe, that's where I usually see like camera with lens deal. So hopefully you'll get one. It's a great camera. No, Marco, how you doing, buddy? <laughs> it's okay. Uh don't say that, Rob. I still have to sell my M1X. <laughs> I didn't say anything too bad. I mean, it, it is it is good for birding and wildlife. I think I was a little hard on it, but compared to the OM1, it's not. There's no comparison. But it's better than the M1 Mark III, certainly, and it's certainly excellent for event photography. I would. I would strongly consider it. I mean, it's six hundred bucks. I would strongly consider getting one just to do event photography, but I don't do a lot of event photography, so. I'm a fair weather newbie, Vermis, the X100V is awesome. I still use the one for field photography, but for going out on social events, you can't beat it unless the GR4 is made, yeah. Yeah, the OM1 and the X100V, they're very different cameras, right? I would certainly take an X100V for social events and stuff way over, way over an OM-1. Like I said, I take my Pen F out. And that's what I talked about in the beginning was the Pen F is just, it's only a little bigger, which is a fair trade-off for the advantages you get with interchangeable lens cameras. Uh, let's see. Gosh, the chat jumped again. What are alternatives to using Adobe Lightroom, and do you think there are better RAW developers over Adobe that work better with OM system files? I think, yeah, DxO Photo Lab is the best RAW developer I've ever used. I think Capture One is a very, very close second to my eyes, but it lacks the denoising module that you get with DxO. So, Photo Lab uh, Capture One, I think, is is as good at developing raw images as DxO, but it doesn't have the denoising ability of DxO. In terms of final output, now in terms of editing features, I think there's pros and cons to both. Capture One is certainly much more robust in terms of editing features with you know. Uh, the layering and selective masking and things like that. Also, they have unparalleled uh, tethering tools for professional work. So Capture One is, is a much more robust photo editor and will get you 99.9% .9 of what PhotoLab can do in terms of final output quality, except when it comes to noise reduction. When it comes to noise reduction, very, very, nothing competes with it in my opinion. So your best option is Capture One with Pure Raw 4. Awesome combination. Expensive. I don't know what Capture One costs these days, but you know, I'm sure it's not gonna be cheap, a cheap option. Or you get Photolab 7 Elite, which doesn't have great tether. I don't think it has tethering at all, come to think of it. And <clears throat> the, the editing tools are not as robust as Capture One but it has 99% of what you need to edit a photo for most of us. Even, even the most diehard enthusiast, I think, uh, you know, will find everything they need in PhotoLab. But Capture One, I think, is more, has their eyes more on professional use and professional editors. So the workflow is very different. It has a more robust uh, cataloging feature or whatever they use for data asset management. Certainly, because PhotoLab 7 has virtually no data asset management. It has a search feature, but it's pretty weak on that end. But what sold me was the final output. Image for image, PhotoLab is the best, in my opinion. Uh, the, other, the other alternative is from Adobe themselves, the PhotoLab, I think it's called Photoshop Elements, right? Excellent software. Does probably 80, 90% of everything Photoshop does or Lightroom, but it's like a one-time purchase, like a hundred bucks or less. And I think it has denoising now, the AI, I'm not sure about that, but I think it's an excellent editor. Uh, 
for the money. That would be my second choice. If you're brand new to photography and want an easier to use interface, I would take the Adobe Elements over DxO because DxO is a little bit more enthusiast oriented and you have to be kind of pretty good at editing to begin with. You're not going to just open up photo or DxO Photo Lab and and edit an image very easily. Whereas something like Photoshop Elements, you can do that. They have all kinds of presets built in and and you know, it's very intuitive how to use it. Another good editor is Luminar, but Luminar is very, very different in the workflow. Luminar has a much more creative approach, right? So you start with a preset usually when you're in Luminar. You don't start with your raw image. You open the image, but then before you start editing, the best workflow in Luminar is really to start with a preset. And then once you've selected the preset and look that you want, then you can go in and start editing, right? Uh, so I think Luminar is more of a creative tool than it is a photo editor. You can certainly do everything you can with just about any other kind of photo editor for the most part, but the workflow is not as smooth. I think the workflow in, in other, other editors if you want to play with sliders and masking and, and things like that, the workflow in other editors is better than Luminar. But Luminar is very good with their AI tools, the creative approach to your images, uh, starting with a basic preset and then working with the AI tools that they have. I think Luminar is very good for that and it's, and it's, it's more plain English, right? They're not using... Uh, <clears throat> more photocentric words as they are more like words that a normal person would use, you know. Um, I, I haven't opened up Luminar in a while and they, they, they keep reaching out to me to review their product. And I, I, I want to do it. Um, but my brain is wired around Photolab and Lightroom, Adobe Photoshop, and Luminar is very different. Your brain, well, you have to change the wiring of my brain very differently to use Luminar. But th those are the key ones, Capture One, Luminar, Photolab. Those, those are the ones that I'm familiar with. And I think those are the ones, you know, you make your choice based on your budget, your workflow. If you're a professional, C1 makes more sense, right? Capture One. Uh, if you're an enthusiast, I think Photolab gives the best results. But if you want the most robust, you know, and, and I'm sorry, if you're more a creative type, Luminar makes sense. But ultimately, you know, Lightroom and Photoshop is hard to beat. It's a subscription model. Ten bucks a month is what I pay. Maybe they've gone up, but I think it's still ten bucks a month. For my professional work, I have to use it because the workflow between Lightroom and Photoshop is, is so smooth and transparent that I can't do it easily with anything else. Uh, so I think as a professional photographer, if I had to pick one, I would have to pick Lightroom and Adobe. Adobe uh, Photoshop Lightroom combo pack because of the workflow, not because it gives me the best results, but because the workflow for professional work that I do with layering, blending and stuff, I have to use it. All the AI tools are kind of fun to play with. I don't care about that stuff uh, so much. You know, because Photoshop and they they have these AI tools for bad. They're fun to play with, but uh, they're not game changers for me in what I do. But as an enthusiast photographer, Photolab for me has been the best, giving me the best results for my birds and flight photography. Like you saw that owl on this little piece of crap. Well, this is not a this is a great camera, but this ten year old camera. You saw the results of this. It's amazing, amazing what what. Photolab can do with this, the images from, from just about any camera. And then uh, 
is the ease of use with Adobe products more user friendly than the competition? No. It's not. Adobe Photoshop, Lightroom, Capture One, Photo Lab. If you're starting from scratch, they all have a pretty similar learning curve to get good, good at. And because Photoshop is so robust, it's kind of a lifetime thing. You'll never learn everything. But you can get very proficient. But yeah, the learning curve is about the same. So ease of use is not really any different to get you editing photos to a competent level. Uh, Luminar is probably easier than all of them. And Adobe Photoshop Elements is easier than Photoshop, but not as easy as Luminar to learn. I think. Does it make any sense to you how on markets now? Yes, they focus on wildlife outdoor niche, but they never mentioned that it still does just as well as ever with portraits. Yeah. I think, like I said, I, I think they're doing the best they can with what they have. If they try to market or remind people that it works well with other genres, that might be too much for them to handle. Um, yeah, I, I think I think they're doing the best they can, and what they're doing makes sense to me. If they try to add in yeah we can still do street we can still do portraits we can still do uh <clears throat> not 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 macro but like uh product photography all the other genres right uh astrophotography they don't they they do mention because it's part of the outdoor wildlife thing but it's not as strong as yeah wildlife outdoors I, I think they're doing okay. I, I I don't know. I don't know why they don't they can't expand it, but I assume there's a reason. But it makes sense that they want to focus on a particular market and, and try and penetrate that as much as they can. Interesting that the OM12 and the 150 to 600 lens were bought out with were bought out without information, but still waiting for 50 to 250 lens on the lens roadmap. Um, yeah, they didn't just come out of nowhere; those two products, right? But the 50 to 250, yeah, we're waiting. We'll see. Olympus brought the OM3 discontinued five years later. They reintroduced the 3TI because of high demand. That's a lot higher price. Huh. Okay. Um, I'm testing an interesting bracket, particularly for use with the Panasonic G9 Mark II. I'll be buying it. But will, of course, work with my OM1 and even my Sony setup. Hmm, okay. You mean like a cage, right? For all your gear, I assume, to attach your SSD and um, maybe a microphone, whatever, a monitor. Makes sense. So I was out three hours yesterday in the rain. I, I think I read that already. I don't know why. Did my chat jump again? Yeah, that 25 Leica, right? It's really nice. I think it's, oh, I have it in my dry box, but yeah. I knew you would like it. I, I recommend that lens to anybody. Especially if you don't have the Olympus 25 1.8, get the 25 1.4. Get a used one in mint condition for 250 bucks, the version one. It's amazing. Uh, after the original, why did that come up again? Um,
Yeah, this this is the problem. My chat jumped all the way up to 9 a.m. Why? I need to... Sorry, give me a second. This chat window that I look at is is just all over the place sometimes. So thanks for your response. I'm aware that the 300 F4, but thought 302.8 will move the micro four thirds close to full frame for bokeh and also give greater headroom for shutter speed. Well, I think um, yeah, the headroom for shutter speed would be nice, definitely. I don't think bokeh is really a problem even at F4 because. You're at such long focal lengths. I mean, some people talk about that. They want more separation. But um, most people, I don't think, have a problem with the current uh, separation they're getting. Oh, and they benefit from more... User-friendly menu, OM system needs ability to save customized video settings. Oh, I know. I know. It's crazy. How can you not have customized video settings and being able to save those? It's been, it's been a problem for a long time. And everybody else does it, especially now. If you look at Tech Radar, Canon is now making a fixed lens X100V type camera. They want to jump. I know, right? And this is this is a conversation I had with another viewer, you know, offline. Was if Canon and if Canon and Sony get into the vintage, retro, not vintage, but retro camera, you know, uh, what do you fat? If, if 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 Canon and Sony get into the retro camera craze right now or fad it's over no way can om systems get into it at that point uh that's why if they came out with it now they would have a head start and capture some of that market for people that can't get their x100s right because x100s are back ordered for for basically a, your lifetime you're going to go to the grave without getting your camera order in on time but Penev could capture that, right? Because they could be in at a lower price than the Nikon ZF, certainly higher than the ZFC, because ZFC is like a thousand or twelve hundred bucks, give or take. But they can get in there right at the same price as the X100V, and I think deliver a better product. And if they can do that before Canon and Sony, they're good. But they're not going to do it. Canon and Sony are going to come in. And uh, it's over. They're never going to come out with a Pen F2. Because the market will be... Everybody that's going to buy a retro camera has bought one. If Sony and Canon get in, <laughs> then everyone's bought one, right? I mean, a lot of people already gotten the Z, ZFC and ZF. And a lot of people have, have the X100 series, right? Maybe not the five or the six yet. They're probably still waiting, but they're getting their cameras. So that market is shrinking and shrinking. There's a finite market. Not everybody wants a, or cares about a retro camera. So if Sony and Canon get in, that market is going to be dried up fast because you know they're going to be able to crank out everything everybody needs on time. Uh, Rob Trick and Everyone are all, no, they're not all able to do focus stacking. Only, only like the pro lenses and the macro lenses. If you put on like a regular F1.8 prime, like the 25, the 45, they're not going to do focus stacking. But if you get the 25, 45 pro, or you get the 60 millimeter macro, the 12 to 40 pro, these lenses have focus stacking. Don't confuse that with bracketing. All of them will do focus bracketing but not all of them will do in-camera focus stacking, uh, just to be clear. DxO is wow. It is wow. It's amazing. It's amazing. 
The sad news is in my area, I can't find a retailer that has an all-in-one or all-in-one Mark II in stock for hands-on experience. That doesn't bode well. I can try out Canon Nikon Sony. I know, right? Even my local camera store, they got they got one OM1 with a 12 to 45, but they don't have body only. Um, I think when it first came out, they you know last month they could they had both, but now their their stock's a little bit limited. And I don't know if that's because they don't want to order more, or if that's because they're having a hard time getting more. Pentax is going on its own path. They are bringing out a new Fujifilm film camera. This I know, right? <clears throat> and they thought out a black and white only camera last year. Yeah, that's interesting. That that black and white Pentax still it's on my short list, but it's probably still going for full price or more right now. Um, I don't know what they're thinking with a film camera. That thing better not be more than a hundred bucks, uh, because I think. There's another film camera out right now that does half frame that's like less than a hundred bucks. So whatever Pentax does, it it can't be more than that. They're gonna have a hard time selling it. I think on systems start making more compact, lightweight, faster lenses, be competitive with Nikon and Sony. These two companies are starting to make smaller, lighter lenses than M43. It's relative. Um We'll have to see. I, if you want to talk about equivalent focal lengths, you know, you buy a 50 millimeter, uh, like a 45 millimeter f1.8. I don't know any 85 millimeter full frame lenses that are small and lightweight. There's no comparison. Uh, so, ultimately. The lenses are always going to be bigger on full frame because the total light throughput has to be four times as much. The total light flux that goes through the lens, the image circle has to be bigger, right? Hence the, the light flux. So there's there's just no way a full frame lens will ever be as small as a micro four thirds lens. Just currently physically impossible uh, given the current lens technology. There's certainly some technologies on the horizon that could basically eliminate the bulk that we have in all the lenses today, where they use, I think the idea is they use micro lenses on the lens itself, right? Like we have micro lenses on our sensors. They're talking about using micro lenses on the lens. And I don't think that's, I think that's still in, still in the research phase and they may have some prototypes, but that's a technology that's going to dwarf or really make the lenses tiny to where, you know, they're not going to, you know, you're going to have a pancake lens that does everything, right? <clears throat> and be like an F1, F.95 pancake lens with a zoom range from five to 300, something like that. And it's only this big, <laughs> but I'm just fantasizing. But there is, there is some, there is some, I know some work being done about micro lenses on the lenses and somehow that's going to make the lenses like nothing in size but the way lenses are now designed right you have concave convex lenses you have lenses cemented together you know all these you know high refraction you have spherical lens elements there's all these different kinds of lenses that they use now in all their lens designing software that, uh, you know, lenses are what they are. If they make two lenses the same size, same focal length, same aperture, but one is full frame and one is micro four thirds, the full frame has to be bigger because the light flux, the light throughput has to be four times as much basically, right? To achieve the same light output per pixel. So anyway, but I get it, you know? They come, uh, you know, I really like the the two point five lenses from Sony. They're kind of expensive. I'm not gonna. I just bought a kit lens for my Sony, <clears throat> the twenty eight to sixty, and that is really small. This twenty eight to sixty, and it's like a f three five to something. I don't care about the aperture on a kit lens. I always shoot it like f five six or f eight anyway, if not f eleven sometimes. 
uh, so why spend money on a 1.8, a 2.5, or a 1.4? Why spend money like that if you're not shooting at those apertures anyway? Um, but okay, anyway. And Walter is here. Hey, buddy, how you doing? I thought you were doing a uh, senior photo. I guess it's still early. You're doing a senior photo shoot today. So I like the USB-C port on my Z9. I never removed the battery to charge it. Wow. Personally, I don't like to charge in camera. Uh, I just don't like the idea of the, the voltage going through the circuit board at the kind of amperage that it can go through with a USB-C port, right? Because the electronics inside the camera, I don't know. I just, mentally, I can't do it. I'd rather use an external charger when possible, but there are certainly times when I want to just charge it in camera or use the camera via the USB-C port and not use the battery in the camera. Uh, like when I'm doing my uh, self-portraits and things, I like the camera running off the USB-C port so the battery's not just dying every time because the, ca the, the camera stays on constantly and it's only good for an hour and a half or so, realistically, through the battery. So I can have with a USB-C port, the camera on for hours and practice. The new Nikon Z400 f4.5 is very compact and light for a super telephoto lens full frame. Oh, I haven't seen that one. But it's a 4.5, right? So that's not very fast. Uh, Let's see what they say. <clears throat> I've not heard of this lens. And though, <clears throat> all right, so 4.5, it's, wow, there's already used one on the market for 2,500. Okay, brand new. All right, three thousand bucks, brand new, and that is two hundred and fifty bucks off. But okay, so three K. So it's about the same price as the three hundred F four from uh, what you call it, OM Systems, right? Let's see what the size is of this. So this is a ninety-five millimeter front filter, so it's pretty big opening. Uh, 1,200 kilograms. So it weighs about the same, I think, as the 300 F4. Let's, so let's put them side by side. Um, so we'll do this. And Olympus. Olympus 300 millimeter. So this one, uh, so the Olympus is 200 grams more, but is smaller. So if you look at, if you look at the, the size of the lens, the actual physical size of the Olympus is smaller. Uh, primarily because it's oh interesting but it weighs 200 grams more but the weight it's a tough call because the weight is going to depend on the overall build of the lens if that includes the lens collar or not I'm not sure if the, you know what this weight is exactly but Nine rounded. We have better magnification on the Olympus system because we have a closer focusing distance. Now I get it. It's a 300 and not a 400. They're not the same lens. But uh, 
Who else makes 400 millimeters? Let's look at another 400. Ah, uh, the 2.8. No, we can't compare that. Can't compare it. There's not really anything else out there, is there? What's this? 400 F4. All right, this is comparable. Can't compare the F8s. The Pentaxes, you really can't compare. Uh, how about this one? No, 2.8. All right, so let's let's look at this last one. So this one is 2.1 kilos. Wow, it's a lot heavier. But why? It's it's an F4. 18 elements. There's got to be a reason. This and this is an S lens. This is a good lens. So Z mount FX, nano crystal coat. Ah, oh, this looks like a really good lens, though. I don't know what the build quality and all that is like. Uh, you know, the fact that it's smaller and lighter, or not smaller, but the fact that it's lighter, just kind of implies there's more plastic in the build somewhere. I mean, they just can't make a lens physically bigger than our 300, but then be lighter without using plastics, right? Uh, so... I don't know. I haven't. I haven't even that. I have never even heard of that lens until today. But you can see it's physically a bigger lens. It's just lighter, uh, and I, I that has to be because of the use of plastics or thinner metal or something. There's there's no other way around that. Anyway, okay. Uh, See, I picked up the Minolta X700 film, loaded some Milford Delta. Man, I forgot how much work film is. Yeah, I know, right? Um, says, I agree. Some switch brands because they imagine it will make up for their inability or lack of vision or creative. Wonder how often changing actually improves their work. Uh, never. <laughs> I would say it never improves their work. Assuming assuming their work is okay already, right? But if you if you're if you're doing good photography already, um, you're probably not upgrading cameras as often either. I love my M1 Mark III, but I also love taking out my old GF1. Yeah, I know, right? I mean, the OMD EM1 series and the OM1, these are work cameras, other than wildlife, right? For me, these are these are work cameras. They're not take off fun cameras. Uh, but you know, I like I like the Pen F. That's my take off for fun camera. Yeah, G nine had the five hundred deal until March second. Yeah, I know, right, Mark? I was in the same way. I was like, man, it's close, but I couldn't do it because I have the I have the OM one, right? You have the OM one. What does the G92 really bring to the table? Unless you're going to do some hardcore video. Given the stated direction of the OM systems, an OM1X could be a real possibility. Yes. Definitely. Um... I'm curious about the metrics of that, you know, because the EM1X sold pretty well, and a lot of people love those cameras. But the same could be said of the Pen F, if you ask me, but they're not making another one. I don't know. But the EM1X is in their, in their genre, right? Panasonic has a better menu system. I agree 100% on that, man. Panasonic... 
I think it's the best menu system of all the cameras I've used. Now, I haven't looked at Pentax very much, but uh, definitely Panasonic. For me, I was very intuitive. I was able to get in there and do anything I wanted with that camera very quickly without having to look at the manual. There's certainly some things I have to go look at the manual for, but for the most part, to go out and shoot and do most things that that camera can do, you can do it right through the menu system without looking at the manual. And that, to me, tells you how good the menu system is. Whereas Olympus OM Systems, even the new menu system, it's still, it's still, you know, you, you have to look at the manual a lot. I, I have to look at the manual a lot to figure out what's going on, uh, especially in the beginning. You know, now that I know everything about Olympus OM Systems, not everything, but I know most stuff, I don't have to look at the manual quite as much, but sometimes I do. I still do to this day. I have to go into the manual because some things are just not right and some things still irritate me. But overall, OM Systems and Panasonic, I think, have better menu systems than all of them. Canon, I'd put third place. Uh, then Nikon and Fuji dead last. Fuji, I would put Sony before Fuji, but those two I'd put at a tie for dead last. Fuji and Sony have the worst menu systems. So I go Panasonic, Olympus, uh, Canon, Nikon, Fuji, Sony. Some people that that list may be exactly opposite, right? <laughs> All depends how your brain is wired. I've been, I've, my brain it was wired with Nikon or Sony from day one. That was my first camera. Then I went to Nikon, and Nikon is not too dissimilar from Olympus. Actually, they're very similar menus, uh, in in their methodology. You know, A, B, C, D, menu one, two, three, four, feature A, B, C, very similar methodology. So I have the 35 to 100 F2 adapted old lens. Oh yeah, yeah, that that was a good lens. For high speed shooting, you're, you are limited. It works a bit faster if it is wide open, but it does not autofocus. Yeah. I've heard that for the four thirds lenses, the autofocus is a little bit, a little bit off. Hi Zoltan, how are you? Good to see you. Wow, you charging camera too. Wow. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it if I don't have to. I got a I got a whole rack over there of chargers, external chargers. I always buy one. Most of them because the cameras didn't come with a charger or whatever, but uh like I had to I had to buy another charger for this camera. Um it's just piling up. I'm going to need a whole shelf rack system for chargers one day. It's getting crazy. Can you use DxO by itself? And if you use Apple Photo, I don't, I'm not familiar with Mac. But yeah, you can use DxO by itself. It doesn't have a data asset management feature. So you would drag things from, I think they call it Apple Finder or whatever. Uh, you would manage your photos using your Apple, but you would point to those photos in DxO. And we're talking about PhotoLab. Uh, you can also use Pure Raw 4 by itself. They, they can be totally independent applications uh, without, without the need of any other editor. Nikon Face Fresno technology. Yes. That is, that is, that they're using basically a Fresnel lens technology, right? To shorten the overall length of the lens, but they cannot change the diameter, right? So they can use, they can make shorter lenses with longer reach, right? But the diameter is not going to change. And generally speaking, you still need the same number of elements to, to get a high quality image, you know. Uh, so ultimately, the lens will be shorter and lighter because it's getting extended reach. Uh, yeah, they're, they're 300 f4. 
their PF lens, right? That thing is very small and lightweight in terms of length. Diameter is not, not any different. It's still pretty wide diameter, the circumference of the lens. But because of that Fresnel technology, but I don't know what the compromises are with that. I don't know. I don't know why everybody isn't doing that. I, I suspect the Sigma 500 millimeter might be doing that. But I'm curious why it hasn't been implemented more often, right? Especially in the super telephoto lenses. But I'm not a lens engineer or anything. I mean, I, I study as much as I can about lenses and lens design. And a little bit sticks in there, a little bit. Hopefully I remember it correctly. Uh, but I don't understand why that, that PF Fresnel type design is not used more often. There must be a compromise somewhere for them not not doing it. Um, and a new uh, Anwar says from Malaysia. I've been there once. <laughs> Just for your info, I'm buying Olympus camera because of you, Robin and Robin. Oh, awesome! Awesome. I mean, ultimately, you want to buy it for yourself and for reasons that, that are important to you, right? But the key difference is, you know, we're here to support in any way we can these camera systems. Uh, and that's something you don't find too often. You find it a lot in Fuji, actually, but... Um, I, hopefully, you know, if you if you value s small, compact, lightweight cameras that offer amazing quality, again with compromises. But I think those compromises are are minor compared to the advantages of Micro Four Thirds. So, uh, I I would never hesitate recommending Micro Four Thirds to anyone for almost any kind of photography. Yeah, you may have to invest in a couple of chargers. <laughs> and then uh, Norm says, one month, two camera says, Lumix G9 is our favorite camera of all time. Really? The G9? The G9? No kidding. I think I saw that video. I don't remember. She said the G9. But me, I, I, I believe you. I just don't remember what camera. I can't remember what camera she said it was her favorite. I can't. I didn't think it was the G9, though. But if it is, it is. It's going for about 600 bucks now. It's tempting. I'm tempted to get a G9. Because I've always wanted that camera. But my problem is, I want the S1R more than I want the G9. The G9 has 90% of what I want in a camera, right? Which is that top plate LCD, which I miss. I miss that on most of my cameras. I'm trying to think, do I even have one now? Oh yeah. The Fuji. Fuji has, oh, this is the Sony. They all look alike after a while, right? Fuji, this Fuji has the best top plate LCD of all time. I love this. Um, and it turns white. I know, right? I spent a couple thousand bucks just to get that. That's the second dumbest thing I ever bought was this Fuji. This this is the this is the, the dumbest thing I ever bought was this Sony A7R5. Camera's great, but makes no sense. Makes no sense for what I do. Anyway, uh just like the S1R makes no sense. Or the G9. I don't need another camera. God knows I don't need another camera, but I can't help it. I can't help it. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the grave with my cards maxed out because I keep buying all these cameras. Oh, but yeah, the G9, I I I have to try one. I don't think I've even held a G9 in my hands before. I haven't. I have to I have to find one and and feel one and then maybe I'll like it more. You got it with the lens for 600 bucks? Oh, 
My God, that would have been a no-brainer. That's a no. I, I haven't seen it with the lens for 600. I've seen it without the lens for 600, but not with the lens. But we're getting there. Oh, man, we're getting close. I might get a G9. I don't know why. I'd rather have an S1R. Oh, anyway. All right, everyone. Uh, any other questions or anything? Because I'm going to wrap it up. If you guys, uh, hopefully I got everything. Um, I'm going to check the chat. I, I know I miss questions every week or comments. I don't know how Robin does it. I mean, he 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 ends with a lot of not answered, but that's not because, you know, he missed them. It's because he just ran out of time, right? Uh, but me, I miss them all the time. I don't see anything, but... Um, all right. I really appreciate everyone being here. Uh, hopefully, um, we'll see you guys again next week, God willing. Uh, and I will... Um, I will try and do some shooting, but I have some review videos coming out for lighting products. Like I said, lighting is the most important thing in your photography. So that's why I've been doing them, even though they're not very popular. I don't, you know, it's like nobody watches my lighting videos, but they're really important, I think, overall. But you guys, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Thanks for being here. I'll see you guys again next week. <laughs>